Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just wait for everyone to file in. Um, if you wouldn't mind turning your cameras off, if you're a participant, that'd be brilliant. Just for bandwidth. Um, and I will get started. So welcome to Connect for session six. Um, I'll just give a minute for everyone to come in. My name is Rachel Aldridge, Communications Project Manager at Cross River Partnership. We have three expert speakers today and the session will cover how adapting the public realm is vital for a green recovery. Um, oh, I think some people are just off mute, so if you wouldn't mind muting, that would be brilliant. Um, this session will look at interventions and guidance on how public space could be made more sustainable, more inclusive and safer for all those who use it. Um, so firstly, Lucy Mignot, Public Realm Lead at the Central District Alliance, will be presenting on CDA's upcoming Public Realm work. CDA is the Business Improvement District compromising of Hoban, Clark and Well, Farringdon, Bloomsbury and St Giles, a representative for over 400 organisations. CDA, CDA prioritise sustainability, destination modelling, business solutions, public realm and placemaking. We will then hear from Fiona Jenkins, Associate at STEER. Fiona will be launching CRP's recent study with STEER, so walking freight um, feasibility study. Walking freight is a mode of logistics where foot-based supporters play a key role in deliveries and collections, and this model has significant potential to expand within London um, as it has advantages over other logistics modes, which make it more efficient and commercially viable choice in specific circumstances. And finally, we've got Ross Phillips, Sustainable Transport Manager at CRP, who will be launching Towards Vision Zero guidelines to help local authorities in the development of road danger reduction strategies and action plans. So the report analyses collision trends and patterns across um, 10 central London boroughs as part of the TFR funded um, Central, central London Sub-Regional Transport Partnership, um, looking at 10 case studies across London too. Um, so hopefully from these three speakers, you'll get a really good feel for the public realm, London's environment and local recommendations. But definitely please feel free to ask questions as we go along and I'll pick these up at the end with the speakers during the panel discussion. So just really quickly a bit about Cross River Partnership. We are working in partnership with London's um, local authorities, business improvement districts and other private partners to deliver environmental, economic and community focused projects. We support public, private and voluntary organisations to address creatively challenges around those four topics on screen. So air quality, transport, placemaking and wellbeing. CRP is putting communities at the heart of everything that it does. So this means co-designing, co-delivering, co-evaluating all our projects. So sometimes this is with residents, sometimes with businesses and sometimes with visitors, but sometimes all three. Um, so in this way, we maximise the benefits achieved together. Just a few examples on screen um, of some, some of our different projects and their links to the local community. And you can take a look at our brand new communities page on the CRP website just um, to see some of our community based projects. I believe there'll be a link in the chat. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce Lucy from Central District Alliance to start things off. So over to you, Lucy. Hello, uh, thanks so much everybody for joining. Um, and I will begin just to talk a little bit about the Central District Alliance. Rachel gave, kindly gave a short introduction to ourselves and we too. May I move on to the first slide? Oh, thank you very much. So Central District Alliance is one of London's, or I think I believe the UK's earliest bids, established in 2005, one of the first five, and we're the collective voice of over 400 businesses um, in the area you can see sort of surrounded by the blue line on the map. So stretching from Tottenham Court Road in the west all the way to Barbican in the east. And now, very excitingly, also we have within the CDA's footprint two um, newly opened cross rail stations. So highly connected um, business improvement district. And if I may move to the next slide. So Central District Alliance, as a bid, we have developed a set of objectives that anchor our investment in public realm at all levels, large and small. And these are rooted in the CDA's strategic objectives as a business improvement district representing businesses, but also in the principles of people centred places and and also reflect some of the larger changes in our external context, particularly climate and sustainability. Um, 
And today I'm going to talk just a little bit about one of those, um, very much touching on the topic that we're discussing kind of as a group, and that's a safe and sustainable movement. If I move on to the next slide. So this, this objective is really about how we as a business improvement district can support public realm proposals that deliver a safer and more sustainable movement and how that might reflect the needs of businesses, workers, um, residents and visitors all at the same time as a rather kind of complex and very dense part of London. So we're focusing on investing in public realm proposals that improve walking routes, making them more welcoming and easy to navigate. We've got these fantastic, um, fantastic new crossrail stations opening in addition to several other um, public transport um, stops, but walking between them and making those routes easy to find is a real priority for everybody moving through the CTA district. Cycle routes is also something that we're really keen on investing in to improve and making those sort of also parking and stopping points safe and comfortable to use and also working to mitigate the negative impacts of vehicle movement, which I'll touch on a little bit more next if I may move on to the next slide. So thinking again about those contextual external factors, obviously extremely prescient with the um, changes that were in that happened over the COVID lockdowns. So Hoban and Clerkenwell are very centrally located, sort of bustling, were, were very much pre-COVID and returning to being very bustling areas. They're highly connected and even more connected with the opening of two crossrail stations. But over the COVID period, everybody has had the chance to reflect on both the pros and the cons of that connectivity, that congestion that can, that, that can be brought, the pollution and the safety challenges, which is very much what the, the um, Vision Zero report sort of talks about quite a lot. So um, why does a business improvement want, district want to focus on this now is very much thinking about how that investment into streets and shared spaces can help to bring a little bit more of a balance that helps to deliver um, streets and shared spaces that also have a better quality of life and a better experience for um, workers and residents in the area, as well as retaining those connectivity advantages that are so important for businesses and located here. So if I may move on to the next slide, I want to talk about one particular project which um, CDA have supported as a co-funder and that has been led by Camden Council. And this is a sort of, uh, currently under construction, which is very exciting. The photo that you can see on the left um, is the breaking ground of the street that took place just a few weeks ago. And this, so this is on Red Line Street, um, just between Hoban and Chancery Lane. And this project was led by Camden originally um, as part of their sort of healthy, safe and healthy streets initiative. And its aims really touch upon quite a few of the um, quite a few of the points that are part of the Vision Zero report, making walking and cycling safer, reducing motor traffic and reducing um, serious casualties to zero by 2041. All of those are embedded in Camden's transport strategy and um, reflected in this particular scheme. So the support of Central District, District Alliance as a co-funder helped to make sure that this project could come forward as a permanent intervention after its initial trial during the COVID lockdowns. And so that means that at the end of construction, hopefully not, not too far away now, the Red Lion Street will have a new 30 metre long pedestrian and cycle zone and a two-way cycle track, cycle stands and new trees that will help create a sort of greener and more shaded atmosphere. Um, if I may move on to the next slide. And this initial investment by CDA into Red Lion Street is something that we'd really like to build upon to help to, to help leverage some of that really positive change to reduce the negative impact of vehicles. As Red Lion Street is a fantastic cluster of independent businesses between Hope, between Hoban and Chancery Lane, and that's a really fantastic asset and brings a lot of energy to the area. And those independent businesses, we feel that improving the public realm could be greatly supportive for them and also create a better environment and shared space that's greener, calmer, more pleasant with more spaces to eat outside for people working in the area and living nearby. So our next set of proposals for Red Lion Street look at the streets in all three sections, reaching from Theopold's Road in the north to Hyderabad in the south. 
um, our initial investment was focused in the middle, but we'd now like to kind of build that up to, to, to stretch all the way along the street. So at the north of the street, that's very much going to be about where there's a little bit already a little bit more kind of um, bustle and energy from um, the businesses that operate there, but create a little bit more space for, um, for, for dwelling, for seating um, and greening at that end of the road. In the middle of the section of the street, we're looking to further enhance the planting and greening. And at the south of the street by High Hoban is, is more of a sort of quieter part of Red Line Street and where we'd really like to invest in some public realm improvements that help to bring a little bit of the energy of central Red Line Street down towards High Hoban so that people walking along High Hoban will have more of an opportunity to, to see what's going on there and perhaps take a take a turn to the left or right and explore the street a little bit more. So that'll be a bit more about wayfinding interventions, lighting to kind of make that entrance more inviting and new, hopefully new food and drink uses at the south that could be of a temporary nature. So all of this is currently being explored through a series of concept level designs and in very much also in partnership with Camden, which is so really, really, which is really fantastic for us. Really enjoy working with their team. And this, um, these developing proposals are also going to be um, going through a series of consultations with the with local businesses and residents. And one of those will be actually coming up on Tuesday, the 12th of July over lunchtime, where we'll have a pop up um, in the street on Red Line Street, the junction with Sandland. So anybody who would like to kind of come along and see a little bit more about how they're developing, super welcome to do so. And I believe Rachel kindly shared in the chat, there's a link to our website where we have more detailed proposal about our thoughts for Red Line Street as they're developing both north, middle and south sections and a link to a survey, survey to share any more any thoughts that people would like to pass on to the design team while those grow. And I think I will stop there and conscious of time. Brilliant, thank yeah, you so thank much. You so yeah, much. it's yeah. good that we have something tangible that people can get involved with um, and there should be a link in the chat. Um, and any questions for Lucy, we can pick them back up at the end. Thank you, Lucy. OK, so on a similar topic, um, within the placemaking field, but on walking freight, I'm now going to hand over to Fiona from STIR. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time to join the session this afternoon. And thanks to Cross River Partnership for the invitation to talk about the walking freight study. So we had the pleasure of working with ERP on this study over the last few months, and I've got some slides to take you through now that will demonstrate some of our key findings. Thank you. you. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so this is STEER. We are a consultancy specialising in cities, infrastructure and transport. I've been with the company for nearly 14 years and I specialise in special, uh, sustainable transport and urban logistics. So we've just moved into a brand new office off Blackfriars Road after about 30 years on upper ground uh, behind the Oxo Tower on the South Bank. Next slide. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so over the past few years, we've collected quite an interesting portfolio of work in the urban logistics space, where we typically work with local authorities, business improvement districts, developers and landowners to understand how we can make the movement of goods work better for people and places. So just to pick out a couple of examples from this slide, we ran a project working with Southwark Council and Team London Bridge Business Improvement District to develop delivery and servicing plans for some of the area's most complex and high profile tenants and buildings, including the Shard, London Bridge Station and City Hall. We also worked with Cross River Partnership uh, to explore the need for more last mile distribution hubs in central London and the scale of the opportunity to better use some unloved and underutilised spaces like underground car parks, railway arches and vacant retail units as spaces to support the use of low and zero emission modes for the final part of a delivery. Next slide please. Thank you. So we were commissioned by CRP back in December last year and we were asked to do four main things. Those being uh, one, to understand what walking freight is, the reasons it's used as a distribution model and the context in which it's used. Two, to understand the benefits for people and places when you switch from someone driving parcels around to someone delivering on foot. 
three, having gained that knowledge about the context and the geographies in which walking freight is successful and a good choice for operators, we'd identify what the potential was for more of it. Um, and finally, we were asked to identify recommendations to support more <laughs> walking freight as a last mile delivery mode. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I have the next slide. It's not gone on for me. Have they got stuck? I'm moving it along now. Oh, oh um, thank you. One back, isn't it? What's yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. So what is walking freight? So we defined it in our project as people delivering light goods over short distances on foot, and it's sometimes called pedestrian porterage. So in one way, walking freight is nothing new because this is how Royal Mail has worked for over 500 years in this country. But what is new is that driving is becoming less and less efficient in urban areas. So if you're a delivery driver in central London, then you spend a lot of time caught in traffic, navigating one way systems and looking for a place to park. And at some point a few years ago, someone decided whether it's quicker to just walk. So there was a Transport for London funded trial um, delivered by the FTC 2050 uh, project involving a last mile delivery firm called Newt, where they tested the pedestrian porterage concept whereby a van would drop off a consignment of parcels to on street porters and those porters would then deliver the parcels to their final destination by carrying them in the biggest bags that they could find. And that's one variation of the first model that I've described here in the slide. So a van or a hub based model where the pedestrian porters make deliveries and return regularly to their hub during the course of the day, whether that's a, a van that they've parked at the top of the street or a proper last mile distribution hub. The second model that we found some evidence of was an operation where the whole delivery is made on foot. And this is typically a de delivery model that's used by small businesses that have their customers nearby, like florists and specialist caterers. Next slide, please. Um, so we spoke to operators using walking freight as part of their distribution operations to understand why they do it. And they told us that they use walking freight because in very high density, highly regulated and restrictive urban environments, it's more efficient, it's more nimble essentially to have people walk than it is for them to drive. And next slide, please. Sorry if you know, there's a bit of a delay, but I've definitely moved on. OK, have they moved? OK, there we are. Are they, are they moving on for everyone else quicker than, than I can see them? No. No, <laughs> OK, thanks. OK, I, I wondered whether I should just continue to speak. Anyway, um, so through our conversations with operators during this project and by reviewing evidence from previous trials, we identified the range of benefits associated with using walking freight as a last mile distribution model. And the most direct benefit is that there's a cost benefit for operators through doing that last 100 metres of the delivery more efficiently. But what we assessed in this part of the project was the value of the societal benefits of reducing the distances travelled by van and increasing the distances travelled by a zero emissions mode. So we calculated that enhanced and expanded walking freight operations could reduce van vehicle kilometres in London's central activity zone by up to 10%. So that's a 0.4% reduction in all uh, light goods vehicle kilometres driven in Greater London, which works out a reduction of 23.4 million uh, kilometres per year. So boxes two, three, four and five stem from this benefit in that by transferring van kilometres to kilometres walked, there are carbon savings, air pollution benefits, management of curbside demands and reduced road danger. And the final benefit is that there's an, that there is, is the expression of those benefits in economic terms and that we've calculated the wider economic benefit of reducing those van miles driven 
for example, reduce congestion, reduce road wear, reduce environmental impact. I've got a figure with a pound sign attached, and that figure is £37 million in 2020 prices. Next slide, please. So all of the understanding that we gained by talking to operators and calculating the benefits of walking freight helps us to understand which parts of London had the greatest potential for walking freight models of distribution. So those areas are very high density with short travel distances between addresses on a delivery round, and those things often go hand in hand. Um, and similarly, there needs to be a high population density generating that last mile distribution need. So these maps here highlight the areas in wh where these different factors come together and show in the darkest blue colour the areas with the greatest potential for walking freight in London, um, which are central London, more or less in its entirety, um, the Canary Wharf end of the Isle of Dogs and the centre of Croydon. Can I have the next slide, please? Start talking. We asked operators about the challenges that they Based in using walking freight as part of their last mile distribution operations. And I'm going to go slowly in the hope that the slide comes up. And these were the three main challenges that they identified. So the first one was something that we've previously explored with CRP, and I mentioned it at the start of the presentation, in that there's a shortage of suitable space in central London to support last mile logistics operations. So operators need some space in which they can sort the deliveries that are to be made in the local area. And in some cases, they need a hub space to which couriers can return during the course of their round to pick up more deliveries to make. So we know of one operator that is running a walking freight operation from an underground car park in Shoreditch at the moment with interest in any kind of suitable space from which they could run a similar operation to cover uh, more of central London and West End areas, but it's hugely expensive at the moment. The second is that current regulations don't allow the use of powered trolleys on public highways. So powered trolleys mean that pedestrian porters can carry more in each consignment, and this is key for operators who want to make walking through a mainstream part of their operations. Um, and the third is something that will be recognised by disabled people or anyone who's ever pushed a pram or pulled a suitcase around town. So the physical environment can sometimes make it hard to get around. Um, and this is the same for pedestrian porters using quite well laden trolleys, especially if those trolleys comply with the, current, the current highways regulations and aren't power assisted. Have the final slide, please which is about our recommendations for unlocking more walking freight in London. So we've suggested that there's four main areas for action. And the first is to enhance planning policy and skills within local authorities to try and address the issue of the shortage of hub space to support walking freight. And as I said, the shortage of this space isn't a new issue and it's going to take time to correct, but having policy and decision makers who understand the need for and the value of this space is very important. Second is to raise awareness of the need to update the electric assist laws so that the power trolleys can be used on public highways. Um, and the third is to deliver accessible streets. So I have always struggled with this recommendation because there are lots of people who need accessible streets much more than people who are delivering online shopping. So this recommendation is not about equating the needs of pedestrian porters with disabled people or anyone else who finds it difficult to get around. What we mean by this is that we found yet another reason to make our streets and delivery and servicing areas in particular easier to move around. And the final one is for CRP and stakeholders to play the part that they can in developing the walking freight market, potentially through supporting a trial in central London. Um, but there are other smaller, more incremental things to do in the background, like raising awareness of walking freight and its benefits and continuing to speak to operators to understand what they need for their operations to be as clean and green as possible. And that the end of my slides. So, yeah, very happy to take questions in the session that follows.
Thanks so much, Fiona. And I think we've had a couple of questions in the chat and we will go back to those at the end of the session. Brilliant. Yeah, sorry about the tech issues. I don't know why it's been so slow. Um, I'll just hand over to Ross and hopefully you can take over on the slides, Ross. I will sort that out now. Yes, I can, um, but I think my uh, it's been quite slow for me as well. Um, but yeah, I can um, I can take over. Um, but firstly, thanks very much, um, uh, Lucy and Fiona, for your presentations. Both really interesting um, as well. Um, so I'm Ross. Uh, I'm a project manager at Cross River Partnership, um, and uh, I'm here to present our recently launched uh, Towards Vision Zero guidance document. Um, as well. Uh, Rachel, the slides are being very slow, but um, I guess we'll have to. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on as well. Um, so uh, firstly, Rachel has given a bit of a run through of CRP already, um, so I'll um, yeah, sort of keep it brief for the moment, but um, CRP are a test bed for exciting projects and trials. Um, Uh, Rachel, I think you may have taken back control, but I'm not sure. Um, I'll keep moving them forward um, as well. Uh, so we're a test bed for exciting projects and trials for key sustainability challenges, and we're keen to share knowledge and best practice on many topics such as air quality, uh, transport, wellbeing, and placemaking. Um, so CRP manages the uh, Central London Sub-Regional Transport Partnership and facilitates the delivery of these projects on behalf of Transport for London. Um, I'm Rachel, I'm not sure it's, uh, there we go, that's fine, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a collective of senior transport officers and directors from 10 London boroughs, um, shown here on the map, who provide strategic advice for and on behalf of TfL. So the partnership's been active since 2009, and it acts as a trusted impartial forum for the boroughs to share experiences and enable collaboration on key sub-regional transport priorities, uh, delivering projects, innovative pilots and trials, and forward-thinking research and strategies. So um, I've shown some of the reports and outputs um, from our partnership here. Um, these uh, include looking at the future of town centres. Um, Fiona's already mentioned the potential for urban logistics hubs in London, uh, the daily lived experiences of our streets and um, highways and accessibility guidelines. So you can find all these on our website um, and the Central London Sub-Regional Transport Partnership page as well that um, I think Dave will be putting in the chat too. Um, so why Vision Zero? Um, so Vision Zero is a road safety policy that was first adopted in Sweden in 1997 uh, with the long term goal of no one being killed or seriously injured on the road transport system. So it looks at how a road transport system is designed to mitigate casualties um, and serious injuries on our road network. Um, we're looking at Vision Zero for a number of reasons. Um, so Vision Zero is a pressing concern for our uh, Central London uh, partners, as it is um, for the mayor and TfL and lots of lots of different stakeholders. Uh, it ties in with other CRP work as well, um, such as improving accessibility, uh, trying to contribute to improving air quality, um, creating healthier streets, um, and improving the experience of uh, pedestrians, cyclists, and other road users. Um, we're always keen to also explore the changing nature of freight delivery servicing and uh, the impact of COVID-19. So we wanted to commission re research for all these reasons um, to support our partner boroughs and beyond. Um, so STEER were appointed to produce the Vision Zero guidelines um, by conducting the analysis and delivering the recommendations. So I'm delighted to launch our, our latest guidance document um, towards Vision Zero, which is pictured on the screen here. Um, it supports local authority officers by providing guidelines to, uh, to implement successful schemes um, that can improve road safety. And so I'll talk through some of the methodology, um, approaches and recommendations that have come out of the report. Um, so STEER started off with a broad uh, general trend, trend analysis of uh, road collisions in the uh, 10 central London boroughs. 
This was then developed by looking specifically at what made 10 case studies in our partner boroughs successful, and it all fed into the recommendations um, and the guideline, themed guidelines that I'll discuss as well. So um, five years of collision data were analysed uh, for the partner boroughs. Um, I found that from 2016 to 2020, a total of 6,484 uh, fatal and serious collisions were recorded um, across the 10 London boroughs, uh, resulting in 7,386 uh, that were killed or seriously injured, including, unfortunately, uh, 211 fatalities. Um, the graph on the left shows a similar trend uh, for across the London boroughs, um, with um, KSI's increasing from 2016 to 17, um, followed by a, a slight plateau in um, 2017 to 19, and then a decrease in 2020, which is likely influenced by uh, by COVID and changing travel patterns um, there. Um, so moving on to the case studies, we had 10 case studies that were analysed using a uh, statistical analysis of STATS-19 data. Um, the case studies were selected in partnership with our borough officers um, from an initial list of 50 um, nodes. So we're talking about major junctions and 50 links, which is pretty much everything else that connects it. Um, the list was drawn together um, where there was a significant year on year drop um, in the number of collisions um, observed in the study period where it was also cross referenced where an infrastructure scheme was introduced in recent years um, as well. So 10 case studies across um, the central London boroughs and the most common reasons for the success of these case studies uh, were speed reduction strategies, uh, traffic management strategies, uh, improvements to crossings and footways, uh, the provision of high quality cycle facilities and also the removal or reduction in conflict between uh, user groups. So um, I'll go through some of the uh, what's come out of the report in terms of recommendations. Um, we've got nine recommended uh, themes um, and I'll go through a bit in each of detail. Um, our guidance document explores them in much more detail, uh, looks at sort of high, medium or low chance of impact and some of the costs of these measures um, as well and how easy they are to implement. Um, so firstly, uh, pedestrian casualties accounted for 18 percent. Um, of all the casualties and 31% of KSIs across our 10 partner boroughs. So creating pedestrian priority or pedestrian friendly streets um, is really important uh, in reducing uh, pedestrian casualties. So when we're looking at that, we're looking at measures that include improving uh, formal and informal crossing facilities, looking at footway widening and decluttering, uh, improving accessibility, which I know um, Fiona's mentioned uh, too, and also uh, considering more vulnerable pedestrians too. Um, cycle, cycle casualties accounted for 25% of, of all the casualties and 30% across partner boroughs um, of, of KSIs. Um, so there's some really great guidance out there, such as the uh, Cycle Infrastructure Design Guidance, LTM 120, and TFL's London Cycle Design Standards uh, that can show how to improve cycle facilities and infrastructure. Um, but these, when we're talking about measures that improve things there, we're talking about things like segregated cycle lanes, signage towards quieter or lower speed roads, or traffic calming measures to slow down other uh, other traffic. Um, power two wheelers is focused on things like uh, mo motorcycles and mopeds. So a couple of the examples um, of measures that could be considered here are looking at uh, targeting and prioritising interventions where there's hotspot areas with a high number of collisions and also working with bids and business owners to ensure that vehicles and equipment actually meets the, the legal requirement um, too. Uh, so vehicle speed is really important. It impacts whether a collision happens and their severity. So all, um, all 10 London boroughs have, have already introduced 20 mile an hour speed limits on all local roads, and some of them are now working with um, TfL to try and extend this to the um, TLRN network as well. And um, Finally, for this slide um, as well, so um, improving safety on public transport is really important because it can play a role in encouraging more users to actually um, move away from private motorised vehicles, uh, supporting sort of traffic reduction strategies and also reducing the number of vehicles on the road 
um, in general. Um, so local authorities can also promote safe, safer behaviours amongst freight operators and drivers by doing things like incentivising schemes such as um, the freight operation, uh, freight operator recognition scheme, the force scheme, um, with businesses and bids. With traffic management, we're looking at things like uh, permanent or timed road closures, modal filters, one-way restrictions, um, school streets, and low traffic neighbourhoods that can also reduce casualties and collisions. Um, we haven't discussed behaviour change yet, but a comprehensive Vision Zero strategy should also target measures that improve road behaviours, um, awareness about road dangers, and also the interaction with other road users as well. So these could include things like school travel planning, cycle training, uh, pedestrian skills training, and also motorcycle skills training too. Um, and finally, uh, while temporary and interim interventions can't necessarily address all the road safety issues, um, they can make a noticeable positive impact and provide a quick and effective demonstration of the potential impact uh, for more permanent solutions as well. So the need to be innovative about trials and experimental options can't necessarily be underestimated uh, too in providing a long term option for the future. Um, I think we're on to the Q&A session. Thank you, Ross. I'm just going to ditch the slides for now. Um, if you wouldn't mind having the speakers back on camera, and if you're not a speaker, would you mind turning your camera off? That'd be really helpful just for um, the Q&A session. So we've had some asked by the audience already um, by Eventbrite, and thank you so much for your presentation. So firstly, Lucy, how do we persuade councils to remove parking to allow um, for greener and greening and place making interventions? Um, thank you to for the slightly tricky question. <laughs> um, it's as as I'm sure the asker of that question is removing parking is a very very tricky thing to do, um, with a slight slight caveat that depends what type of, of parking, and it's certainly in terms of the projects that CDA is currently has in planning, almost all of our projects involve in some respects a sort of parking question or be it, be it service parking or, um, or parking paid for other types. And that is quite key to um, freeing up space for other things, be they greening, seating or other forms of immunity. Um, I, I guess in answer, I would say that the key thing would be to, to gather sort of a balanced range of views from stakeholders that, that can sort of put forward all of the potential pros and cons from their perspectives and and from the perspective of CDA representing Hope and Clark well that's quite a mixed group of people from local business owners who will have their own um, positives and negatives about that parking not being as available and residents may also feel differently so in terms of us progressing the development of proposals that involve removing parking would certainly be looking to get as wide a range of views as possible so that there isn't perhaps just a very negative voice or just the positive case but that we can be as fair as possible with with that proposal in its development um yes and we also very much recognize the needs of um the very legitimate needs of businesses large and small in their access and servicing and that's certainly a topic that we've sort of touched on quite a bit in the discussions today and that we'd want to make sure that all of the sort of parking removals bear that into into account so that nobody's um, a business is disadvantaged from that. So is a way is there a way that residents can get involved with the bid and things to kind of yeah put pr put proposals and things forward or you know community involvement in that sense? Mm. Um, I mean so in terms of the bid as a business improvement district we are our sort of stakeholders in terms of very directly our local businesses who are located within the bid footprint but that's not to say that we um, aren't very very open to communities involvement um, at all stages so for example with the developing proposals for red line street we are consulting in in public through um, events of pop-up and organized and reaching out to local community organizations to try and involve as many people as we can and hear their hear their views absolutely 
Perfect, thank you. Um, OK, so this is a question for both Ross and Fiona. Oh, we can start with you, Fiona. What role does the panel see for kind of shared mobility hubs, last mile delivery centres and freight consolidation centres? And how should land be safeguarded for these purposes? So a few different elements to that question. Um, yeah, so to take the what role, what role do I see for those in the context of walking freight? They're they're very important, pretty critical actually. Um, so if we just talk about last mile distribution hubs, that's the space from which you run your operation really. So that's you need some space centrally located, um, from which you can, well, from to which parcels come in, and then. They kind of get sorted out and then they get uh, distributed for the, and you know th that that space being in central London being kind of close to the to the final delivery destinations is is very important so that you can use zero emission modes or lower zero emission modes because you need it you need that distance to between the the distribution point and the delivery addresses to be as short as possible um in terms of safe, safeguarding land for that purposes i think the the policy side is i mean th this this issue has been recognized and it's been it's kind of it's been recognized in the london plan so the the, the policy side is is beginning to sort itself out but it's going to take time to to fully correct and, and kind of get this land properly safeguarded. Um, and therefore, I think really what's quite important now is for organisations such as CRP and, and other stakeholders to kind of take a lead and, and kind of begin trialling some of these things and kind of throw their support behind some of the trials and, and provide that support to operators to secure that space. Uh, do you want me to, to to add to it? Um, I would, I would, um, yeah, I, I, I'd probably echo uh, an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of what uh, Fiona said. Um, just thinking of it from the role of it in terms of sort of um, road safety and air quality um, is incredibly important. So normally, things like micro hubs are going to be uh, used by either walking porters or cargo bikes um, and have probably less larger vehicles as well, um, which is generally going to be much better for road safety. They're going to be traveling at uh, probably slightly slower speeds or if they're walking much slower speeds as well. Um, and also traveling with an awful lot less momentum um, as well. So um, from that perspective, it's great. Obviously getting, you know, uh, reducing congestion um, is uh, and also reducing the number of polluting vehicles on the road is going to be really important too. Um, in terms of how land can be safeguarded for it, um, I think it's um, probably seeing it as a really useful revenue source um, for an awful lot of uh, local authorities, strategic agencies, anything, anyone that, that does own a, a bit of land, it can be done on quite a flexible basis. Um, and also being probably thinking quite creatively in not, it doesn't, so something like a micro hub or, or a distribution hub, it doesn't have to sort of be a warehouse. I think, think thinking quite creatively about this, and Fiona's already mentioned people that are operating out of car parks and things like that. Um, you know, as long as it's sort of lockable and secure, um, they're sort of the key criteria and being able to to safeguard any bits that that are are aligned to those objectives is is great. Brilliant, thank you. That's really in depth and useful. So I just think um, we have time for one more question, Fiona. How do you think that making streets more accessible and inclusive, as you mentioned in your presentation, um, will impact the future of walking freight in city centres? Yeah, it, it's important. Um, it, it it can only help, um, and it makes it that bit easier to use a trolley, basically. So if if you're trying to cram in lots of parcels and and deliver quite a lot and quite a lot of um, light goods, but cumulatively uh, uh, quite high high weight, I suppose. Um, it it just makes it bit, that bit easier to use those trolleys. Um, but I think the the other important thing is to think about making, but because I was talking about kind of the, the different needs of different people, so like we need accessible streets for 
disabled people primarily, but then you know there, there are kind of benefits for benefits for everyone, and then eventually there are benefits for for walking free operators too. Um, I think in the context of walking free operators, what kind of makes a real difference um, outside of the programme of making our streets more accessible in general is ensuring that loading bays and kind of servicing areas are accessible on foot. Because if you think about um, kind of basement loading areas and stuff, they kind of go down a ramp, there, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't necessarily be a pavement. So I think it's it, just thinking, thinking about these new modes as we're kind of uh, designing for and building new developments in central London now, um, and just making sure that that people can access them in, in these kind of zero emission ways. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your answers and for your presentations. We're just coming to the end now, but um, I will follow up with the slides and recording and all our contact details if you have any more queries. Um, and I believe Dave will um, post a link to our next session, which is actually going to be hybrid. So um, if anyone is available to join us in person, that'd be brilliant. And I can send over some more information. But yeah, thank you so much again and look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, everyone.